I'm Marty Moss Cohen, and you're listening to Radio Times here on WHYY in Philadelphia. President Trump tweeted recently, all agree the U.S. president has the complete power to pardon. He tweeted this after a story in the Washington Post about the president's lawyers discussing pardons in relation to the FBI investigation into whether the Trump campaign colluded with Russians. Now, Trump's lawyer, Jay Sekulow, downplayed the issue and said the power to pardon has never been adjudicated. Well, that led to the question, can a president pardon him or herself? And joining us is Claire Finkelstein. She's the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law, also Professor of Philosophy and Director of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Joining us here in our Philadelphia studio, Claire, nice to have you back with us on Radio Times. Thanks for having me, Marty. You, let me repeat the uh, president again. All agree the U.S. president has the complete power to pardon. Do you agree? No, unfortunately, I don't. It surprises me some of the commentary I've been hearing about this, so I'm glad to have the opportunity to set it straight. I keep hearing people saying, yeah, he has the power to pardon himself, but it wouldn't be a good idea because he'd have to admit to a crime. And in fact, both halves of that seem wrong to me. So let's start with the question of whether or not the president has the power to pardon himself. And I think the answer is unquestionably he does not. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution says that the The president has the power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States, except in cases of impeachment. So the question is, what does that mean? Let's first be clear. It has to be a federal crime that's at issue. That has been pretty clearly understood. So any state crimes for which the president uh, might be uh, charged or indicted, his power of pardon would be irrelevant. What about the second half, except in cases of impeachment? What could that possibly mean? Well, this is a constitutional phrase like any other constitutional phrase, like due process, like equal protection, like privileges and immunities. And it has to be interpreted. And in general, we interpret constitutional phrases against the background of the purpose for which they were written, as well as common sense. So common sense suggests that this phrase would be meaningless unless it meant that the president did not have the power to pardon for crimes that could lead to impeachment. Well, let me stop you there, because I have a more sort of basic question. And is it about that you cannot be both the judge and the jury. I mean, is that also part of this question about whether a president has this absolute or complete power to pardon and whether he could pardon or she could pardon him or herself? Is it that you you can't sit in judgment of your own on your own guilt or innocent, I guess, your own guilt. That's absolutely right. And, and this is connected with a larger value, which is also an important background for interpreting any constitutional phrase, which is the value of the rule of law. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that the president is not above the law. None of his officers is above the law. The president holds power according to a legal structure that determines the limits of his or her office. And in, and if the president had the uh, unfettered power to pardon himself, he would be, in effect, above the law. Well, and does that get us into the heads of the, the founders, you know, the people that wrote the Constitution, their fear of a monarchy, or perhaps in more current language, a dictatorship? That's correct. And so this pardon power, what it is meant to do, it's important to understand this, is to remove the punishment It doesn't remove the conviction. That's very important. It's very comparable to a governor's power to grant clemency for someone who is, say, on death row. All that does is to say this person will not be put to death, but it doesn't actually take away the conviction, uh, number one. And number two, it's very important to understand that the founders were concerned about making sure that the president exercised power within constitutional limits and according to a balance of powers in the federal government. So if the president had the power to pardon himself uh, and to obstruct impeachment in that way, uh, which could be the result, not necessarily, but it could be, uh, then it would run counter to uh, both, I think, the language and the spirit of this provision. 
Well, interestingly, we have had presidents who have been impeached, Johnson and Clinton uh, being the two. They did not pardon themselves. Does that tell us something? Well, it does tell us something. Uh, This runs into another issue, of course, is whether or not a person has the ability to pardon themselves preemptively. Now, Clinton was not convicted of a crime. So technically, you you ought to only talk about pardons when there is an identifiable crime. But the second half of the common uh, commentary that I've been hearing about this says that you have to wait until a person has been convicted of a crime in order to uh, exercise a pardon. And that part is also not right, Uh at least according to the precedent that we have. Uh, There was, excuse me, a civil a civil war case, uh, and this is really the only Supreme Court precedent that we have, uh, that uh, which is uh, ex parte uh, Garland, which said that uh, Confederate soldiers who had put down their arms could be pardoned uh, even though they had not yet been convicted of a crime. This was obviously intended to bring Confederate soldiers back into the Union uh, and to make them less afraid of uh, putting down their arms Mm. and surrendering. That's the only uh, Supreme Court precedent that we have. And it does look then as though there can be a preemptive pardon, but it's absolutely wrong to think that the president can pardon himself. Let me quote something in more recent history. This goes back to 1974. Uh, this is a, a, a woman who was part of the uh, investigation of Watergate. And this apparently was something she wrote four days before Nixon resigned. Under the fundamental rule that no one may be a judge in his own case, the president cannot pardon himself. Just to underscore what you were saying. So maybe while the the, the Supreme Court hasn't ruled on this, there have been at least written commentary on it of people investigating abuses of power. And we also have prior cases to look at. So, for example, let's talk about when President George H.W. Bush uh, pardoned Casper uh, Weinberger, who was former defense secretary with regard to the uh, Iran-Contra affair. And uh, that was thought to be a, a very questionable move mm-hmm. on his part because it really uh, made it difficult to investigate the president's own potential involvement in that. So on the reading that I'm suggesting, it would not be permissible for the president to pardon himself, but it would also not be permissible for him to pardon other individuals, his vice president or his uh other individuals who are in his administration, if doing so would impede an impeachment because they are also subject to impeachment. So, for example, it would not be permissible on this reading for him to pardon Jared Kushner. His son-in-law. That's right, because he is arguably a civil officer uh, and therefore subject to impeachment under the Constitution. And so pardoning him would be an interference with the impeachment power. Let me read a couple of comments. One from Randy, uh, complete power to pardon in quotations. If, if it means the power of the president to pardon himself could not have been envisioned as allowable or consistent with the principles of the Constitution, specifically the separation of powers. Does that underscore what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly correct. Uh, separation of powers, of course, in this case, doesn't mean ordinary legislation. So it's also quite clear, and the court in the ex parte Garland case reinforced this, that Congress does not have the power to pass ordinary legislation to influence or limit the pardon mm-hmm. power. But what they do have the power to do is impeach, and impeach not just the president, but to impeach civil officers. Uh, now, that's been interpreted to mean fairly high officers. But the pardon power under this provision on Article 2, Section 2, must not interfere with congressional impeachment power. And that's where the separation of powers lies. Can a president be indicted for crimes that predate his or her election? Yes. And here, uh, this is a very important topic these days, uh, especially because of a memo that Charlie Savage unearthed through a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, It is very clear I think that the president can be indicted not just for crimes that he may have committed prior to becoming president, but crimes that he may have committed during his presidency that are 
uh, unrelated to his official duties. So the memo in question that that Charlie Savage unearthed was written by the Office of Legal Counsel uh, during the Clinton years, Ten having star. to do with whether or not uh, President Clinton could be indicted for crimes that he may have committed, either connected with Whitewater or connected with Monica Lewinsky and his the, the sexual scandal. In fact, let me quote it. This is from the Star Office memo. Yes, Charlie Savage in the New York Times. This is just a couple of days ago. Uh, this is what it said. Of course, going back to the 1990s, uh, the Star Office memo says it is proper, constitutional, and legal for a federal grand jury to indict a sitting president for serious criminal acts that are not part of and are contrary to the president's official duties in this country. No one, even President Clinton, is above the law. I mean, those are that's powerful language there. That's right. And it makes a good deal of sense in terms of our constitutional values and the concept of the rule of law, because the president's immunity to uh, prosecution is relative only to his role as president. So to the extent that he is acting outside of his official duties and acting in ways that are not authorized by his office, the law should not be protecting him, immunizing him from prosecution. His immunization comes from his presidential duties. It is not the person that's immunized from prosecution. It's the role. And that's what's critical to the rule of law. Can we throw obstruction of justice in this sort of what we need to understand about that? And of course, presidents fire people. Uh, This president uh, fired James Comey. And obviously, there's some questions about what's going to happen with Attorney General Sessions or maybe even Mueller. I don't want to get over my skis, so to speak. But what what how does the Constitution understand or write about obstruction of justice? Well, the Constitution doesn't. So obstruction of justice is a federal crime. And so the question is whether or not the president can be understood as violating federal law in seeking to uh, obstruct the investigation into his own possible wrongdoing and the wrongdoing of members of his family or associates by getting rid of anyone who's investigating these crimes. Right. Uh, and in my view, it uh, makes out a very good case of obstruction of justice. Uh, were he to fire Jeff Sessions in order to put an attorney general in place so that that uh, new attorney general would then fire Robert Mueller, that whole course of action looks like a very good case for obstruction of justice. If his thought then, uh, according to the apparently rather poor legal advice that he must be getting from his lawyers, is that he can do that and then he can pardon himself and thus stay in office and avoid impeachment, he's, got, he's made a number of legal mistakes uh, that really would not would not serve him well. Well, let's talk a little bit about the attorney general. And I think that that office, that position is un- misunderstood, it seems like, by the president, who seems to view Sessions as his own personal attorney. So on the one hand, the president gets to select who the, who he or she wants to be the attorney general. But the attorney general doesn't really work for the president. Can you help us understand what this relationship is about? That's right. It's very complicated, of course, because we have a, a single branch of government, uh, but there are differentiated roles within that branch of government. So the attorney general, of course, is the highest law enforcement agent in the co- officer in the country. And it's been part of our tradition that the attorney general has a great deal of independence and particularly independence from the president for just exactly the reason that we are seeing playing out here. What's very difficult uh, and what I think the whole country is coming to grips with is that so many of the aspects of the rule of law and the interstitial tissue that holds the rule of law in place have been more by tradition Hmm. than by legal requirement. However, by having those traditions, uh, they in effect become legal requirements because they help to interpret the legal provisions that we have. So in interpreting something like the pardon uh, provision of the Constitution or in interpreting an an obstruction of justice statute, we have to interpret that against the background of our Uh, legal and constitutional and rule of law values. And this independence uh, between the Justice Department, relative independence between the Justice Department and the president is part of what shores up those rule of law values. So the attorney general, in a sense, works for us, works for the public, even though he was or she was selected by the president, or 
is our interpreter of the Constitution? Well, to some extent of the Constitution, but uh, most importantly, federal laws. So the Attorney General is the chief law enforcement officer for the country with regard to federal law. Uh, The Supreme Court is the ultimate arbiter of the Constitution Mm -hmm. and in some sense has review power over the Attorney General's interpretation of federal laws as well. Uh, But the attorney general's role is really um, focused on interpreting federal laws and then enforcing those laws, and that's a very critical part. If there is no independence between the attorney general's office and the the presidency, then it becomes, and we're seeing the limits of this right now, very, very difficult in our system Hmm. to have any check on the president other than the impeachment process. And we're almost out of time here. I, it does feel as if our institutions are being tested. Maybe not a bad thing from your perspective. Yes, they are. And it's quite interesting um, n- not to throw a monkey wrench in the discussion, but it's worth comparing uh, our constitutional tradition and our treatment of the presidency to other countries like Brazil, where we've seen a lot of corruption uh, in the presidency and now a lot of uh, prosecution of uh sitting presidents, former presidents, uh, and in some sense, Brazil is grappling with a lot of the same issues uh, that we Mm -hmm. are, and it's a kind of worldwide lesson in what it means to have a president who serves under the law. Claire Finkelstein, thank you for joining us today on Radio Times. She's the director of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.